Hello again, football fans. Jesse Kurtz and Ted Sunquist here to talk about Mountain West football inside the Mountain West Network studio. Hard to believe there's only two weeks left in the college football regular season. Let's take a look at the standings inside the Mountain West because there is still plenty to play for this weekend and maybe into next weekend. Three teams control their destiny as it relates to getting to the 2014 Sports Authority Mountain West Football Championship game. That would be Boise State, Fresno State, and Nevada. Those two, those, those three teams went out. They're in the championship game. The standings right now show Colorado State at five and one, Boise State at four and one, as is Utah State. Air Force at three and two, Wyoming two and four, New Mexico one and four in the Mountain Division. Over on the west side, we got a log jam at the top. Nevada and San Diego State both tied at three and two. Fresno State at three and three. San Jose State at two and three. Hawaii one and four, and UNLV one and five. Let's start with a very pivotal game on Friday night. Air Force traveling to San Diego State to battle the Aztecs, 6.30 Pacific time on CBS Sports Network. Air Force 8-2 and two overall. They're 4-2 and two in conference. Came off a thrilling win in the snow over Nevada, 45-38. Air Force has gone from 2-8 and eight to 8-2 eight and two over a 10-game stretch in one season. The six-game turnaround tied for the best in school history, tied with the 1958 team. You predicted this team would be the surprise team in the Mountain West. Have they surpassed even your expectations? Well, Jesse, I'm not sure really what my expectations were at the beginning of the season, but i got to be honest with you. I felt this was a program with a lot of pride and a team and a staff that would do everything they could to get things turned around. I think the key this season has been the return of Kale, Kale Pearson to the lineup. No doubt he is the leader both on and off the field for the Falcons. And coming back from that ACL, ACL tear isn't an easy thing to do. I've been through it myself. But the level of play that he's demonstrated is a tribute to the work that both he and the Air Force trainers put in and over the offseason. The sign of any good quarterback, in my opinion, is how he raises the play of those around him, and certainly Pearson has done that. Jalen Robinette and Garrett Brown have emerged as big play receiving threats. Jacoby Owens has recorded a 1,000-yard season, and Garrett Griffin is on pace to be one of the most productive receivers at tight end in the Troy Calhoun era. Then you go over on defense, and the Falcons are playing with a lot of similar faces from 2013, but in a more confident and aggressive style under defensive coach Steve, uh, defensive coordinator Steve Russ. This has allowed the players like linebackers Jordan Pierce and Connor Healy, along with defensive lineman Alex Hansen and safety Weston Steelhammer, to blossom in their own right. When you start getting that kind of consistent play across the board, anything's possible as a team. Dale Pearson, the reigning Mountain West Offensive Player of the Week may find a, a tough going in, uh, in San Diego because Rocky Long teams have typically given Air Force teams a lot of trouble, whether it be at uh, New Mexico, whether it be at San Diego State. What does he do defensively that gives Air Force problems? Well, I'll tell you what, he understands that you've got to take away the inside game, whether with the triple option to the fullback or the read option with the tailback. And he does a good job of ensuring his defense understands this first and foremost. This forces your quarterback to have to be on the spot with his reads and getting the ball to the outside with a sure pitch. It's here that he likes to play games and he really mixes things up to force the errant decision with the athleticism his squads always seem to have over on that defensive side. You got the quarterback trying to read the defensive end one play and the outside linebacker the next. Long gets a lot from his safeties and run support as well. And you look at the production that Nat Burhe had over the years as an Aztec, now with the New York Giants, Air Force was always one of his most productive games. So look for Naeem McGee, who replaced Burhe as the Aztec uh, position in that 3-3-5, and redshirt fresh freshman Trey Lomax to play pivotal roles in slowing down the Falcon, Falcon rushing. San Diego State has won four straight in this series and eight of the last 12. Air Force in San Diego State, 6.30 Pacific time on CBS Sports Network. We have two Mountain West games on Friday night, both kicking off at the same time. The second being San Jose State visiting Logan, Utah to battle the Aggies. 7.30 Mountain Time, ESPN2 will have your TV coverage. San Jose State 3-7 and seven overall, 2-4 and four in conference play, coming off the loss to Hawaii 13-0. The Spartans didn't punt once in the game, but didn't score. Where's the disconnect? Because they were moving the football, didn't punt, but didn't score. Where's the disconnect where they can get it fixed before they take on the Aggies? Yeah, you're right, Jesse. The Spartans outgained Hawaii by 222 total yards. Joe Gray was 25 of 45. He threw for 305. And the Spartan ground game recorded 157 behind Tyler Irvin's 90 on 19 carries. 
And San Jose State just could not finish. Three drives ended in a missed field goal and two blocked field goals. And then Gray had an interception on Hawaii's three yard line and Brandon Moore fumbled on the Rainbow Warriors 16. Add to that seven missed conversions on third and fourth down with four or less to go, and you come up with nothing to show for your efforts. A lot of credit goes, I think, to Norm Child's defense for continuing to force pressure on the Spartans to create the mistakes and missed opportunities, and it doesn't get any easier for San Jose State up against the Mountain West top defense in scoring with only 19 points per game and turnovers with 28 on the season. The Spartans have struggled all season long in the field goal department, ranking last in the conference at 12 for 24, and they're also last in coughing up the ball to opponents with a total of 24, 11 fumbles and 13 interceptions. So for Ron Carragher's crew to come to have a chance on the road, they'll have to get back to that 46.34% third down conversion rate and hammer out some long touchdown drives. The Aggies on the flip side, 8-3 and three overall. They're 5-1 and one in conference. They beat New Mexico 28-21 to 21 last week. Starting to run the ball very well. They lost Joey DiMartino last year, and they've struggled to find a running game. They might have found that against New Mexico. Ran for 272 yards. That's exactly what the doctor ordered for Matt Wells and company when you have inexperienced young quarterbacks taking the snaps to have a running game like that. Yeah, it really has. Head coach uh, Matt Wells has done a fantastic job, masterful job in keeping the Aggie offense on track enough to let his defense really take over in some games since losing Chucky Keaton in week three. But I doubt anyone in Logan expected or anticipated Utah State to be playing with Kent Myers back in August. My point is there's been a lot of catch-up work to do in the passing attack you have to give everyone credit, coaches, receivers, offensive line, and Myers himself for the job he's done thus far. That said, teams want to get physical late in the season as defenses start to tire out and the weather gets a bit uncertain in the Mountain West. San Jose State is ninth in the conference for rushing defense, and Boise State has surrendered 1,366 yards in their last six games. A lot could be riding on the finale against the Broncos if the Aggies can get by the Spartans, and I think everyone would rather see that game in the hands of Utah State's outstanding defense and their opportunistic rushing attack versus placing it all on the shoulders of the game but somewhat green Kent Myers. They're going to be facing a very good quarterback at San Jose State. Joe Gray has tied a Mountain West record throwing for 300 or more yards in five straight games. The only other conference quarterbacks to do that, David Fales, the guy that he replaced, and Derek Carr of Fresno State. San Jose State and Utah State will kick things off in Logan, Utah, Friday night, 7.30 Mountain Time on ESPN2. Let's go over into the... Uh, the Mountain Division, New Mexico at Colorado State, 11.30 Mountain Time. Morning kickoff from Hughes Stadium. Root Sports will have your TV coverage. The Mountain West Network will stream it outside of the Root Sports viewing area. The Lobos 3-7 and seven overall, 1-5 and five in conference play. They lost to Utah State, as we just touched on. But the stable of running backs continues to grow. They got guys down. They got guys that are stepping up. The latest, Ramel Jordan, ran for 96 yards against Utah State, which is a huge task against the Aggies. His best game as a college running back. At the end of the day, there's only one football to go around. They continue to find these guys. Is there enough plays to go around with all these guys that they have running the ball so well? I, I tell you what, it could put a lot of pressure on your quarterback to make the right reads and to spread the ball around in an attack that relies heavily on his decision making. But I think most option oriented teams, they understand what an opponent uh, defense is trying to take away, and it just opens up opportunities for other players in the scheme, like you said. One week it could be the quarterback, like Cole Gauchy's 184 in the season opener against UTEP, or a string of games like running back Jarrell Presley put together against Air Force, UNLV, and Boise State, and then still another player steps up as Jordan did against the Aggies. And then receivers like Tyler Duncan, they get their chance. Two receptions for 74 yards versus the Aggies to turn the big play when opponents cheat up to try to stop the run game. It takes discipline and patience to run an effective op option attack, and sometimes it takes that very same attitude by the players looking to get their chance to contribute. And that can be a heavy challenge on a coaching staff trying to maintain the focus and effort of a team during difficult circumstances. And Bob Davies Lobos have had their share of that this season. Colorado State was idle last week as they get back to work. They're 9-1 overall, 5-1 in conference play. Garrett Grayson, the quarterback, now being promoted as a Heisman Trophy contender. He officially received the notice from the Heisman Trust. 
What does this do for a budding program that is rebuilding to have a guy that receives that notice for the most prestigious award in college football? What does it do for this program? Well, CSU has been really looking to return to the glory years of Sonny Lubick, and head coach Jim McElwain has gotten them back to flirting with that mantra much quicker, I think, than anyone probably imagined. Nothing replaces wins for a program, but with that success comes the attention and notoriety well deserved by the players producing on the field. For McElwain and his staff, that only benefits the recruiting efforts that they're putting out to maintain that dominant consistency that Sonny Lubick and the Rams enjoyed for so many seasons. Recruiting is the lifeblood of any program, and with Garrett Grayson and the Heisman Trophy being mentioned in the same sentence, CSU can now go out and look at some of these top high school players in the country and say, come to Fort Collins, be part of something special. You can accomplish anything here that you can anywhere else. National rankings, national recognition, Pac-12, Big Ten, SEC opponents, and legitimate attention from professional football. The Rams are putting together one of those seasons that can define a program for years to come, and Garrett Grayson has been a huge part of that to date. I think it's great that the na nation is finally taking notice of the job being done by everyone at CSU. No question. Got to get this win and, and going to probably need another win next week against Air Force. But it starts with the Lobos and the race to get to the Mountain West Championship game. The Lobos and Rams will do things up at Hughes Stadium, 1130 Mountain Time. Root Sports has your TV coverage. The Mountain West Network will also stream the game outside of the Root Sports viewing area. Talk about the help that Colorado State needs. They're going to be closely watching what's going on up north in Laramie as Boise State set to take the field against Wyoming at 8:15 Mountain Time on ESPN2. Boise State 8 and 2, 5 and 1 overall. They sit ahead of Colorado State in the standings and they have that head-to-head -head, uh, game in their pocket, coming off a game in which they beat San Diego State 38 to 29. Boise State lately has gotten off to slow starts. It nearly cost them in Albuquerque against New Mexico, and it nearly cost them at home against San Diego State this past weekend. What does Brian Harson and company have to do to light that fire a little bit earlier so they don't find themselves having to play from behind and having these comeback wins that we've seen over the last two weeks? Well, Jesse, I know the staff knows this, but I think you have to overly emphasize the importance of setting the tone in the first five minutes of each half. You talk about it every chance you get with your team, in meetings, on the practice field, in the pregame speech. Pressure has to come from both sides of the ball, and you practice that throughout the week. It's a mindset that has to be developed. Against the Aztecs, the defense was on the field for two drives and 11 plays, giving up an early field goal, and then the offense was three and out in a minute and 19. Against the Lobos, both teams struck with their first play from scrimmage when Jay Ajayi answered Jarrell Presley's 75-yard touchdown run with a 75-yard touchdown reception of his own. But I think that opening play score from New Mexico is exactly what gave them the confidence that they uh, needed to hang with the Broncos for most of that game. Look for the tone that Boise State sets in the first possession on both sides of the ball to go a long way in either taking it to the Cowboys on the road or being in for a late night shootout in Laramie. Uh, we've seen a few of those up <laughs> on the high out. plains in the, uh, the history of the Cowboy program. The Wyoming Cowboys 4-6 and six overall, 2-4 and four, uh, in conference play. They were idle last week. They're coming off a game in which they struggled uh, mightily on offense against Utah State. A lot of teams had done that, but they scored just three points. This after scoring 45 at Fresno State the week before. How do the Cowboys get things going offensively so they can hang with Boise State? Yeah, they had the big play production in both aspects of their offense against the Bulldogs, but they just couldn't produce the same type of explosive production against that stifling Aggie defense. The Cowboys ripped off seven plays of 30 yards or more in Fresno, but Utah State was able to hold Wyoming to a long game of, gain of 18 yards up until the fourth quarter when back-to-back -back completions of 53 and 25 yards only ended with a Colby Kirkguard interception at the Aggie 12-yard line. For Wyoming to have a chance, they're going to have to generate some big play production on the ground, which has come from Brian Hill the past few weeks. Three consecutive 100-plus yard games, in fact, six runs of 20-plus. The windy conditions along the front range and up into the state of Wyoming this week can make throwing the football an ultimate challenge, I think, for both teams. But Hill has shown breakaway ability, and the Broncos have been suspect at times to the mega runs of 30 yards or more. I think this game is going to come down to the team that blinks in the turnover margin. Boise State is even on the year while Wyoming sits at minus one. Both very close right there. 
whichever team turns the football over, I think, is going to have the edge. Boise State rolling right now. They've won five in a row. That is a season high. They do control their own destiny in the race for a championship berth. Again, Boise State and Wyoming, 8-15 Mountain Time on ESPN2. Let's talk about what's going down in Reno. Boy, this is another big one on the west side. Fresno State visiting Nevada, 7.30 Pacific Time on ESPNU on Saturday. Fresno State 4-6 and six overall, 3-3 three and three in conference play. They were idle last week. The Bulldogs still alive for a Mountain West championship berth. That's pretty amazing given the way that they started, but have since turned the tides a little bit. They control the west division. The, it would be on the line in this game if they're able to beat Nevada. How much life would that inject into this Bulldog program, which a lot of people left for dead, and now they've got a chance to get right back to where they were last year. Well, look, no doubt head coach Tim DeRuiter is going to remind his senior class what a tremendous accomplishment that would be for a group that has gone through some emotional highs and lows this season after last year's remarkable run. To still be in the hunt for a return trip to the Mountain West Championship is a bit inconceivable given the start that Fresno State had this season and the three-game conference skid that ended against San Jose State just a couple weeks ago. I think the staff is going to emphasize the responsibility the rest of the team has to the seniors, and I think that uh, they'll in turn call upon the senior group to take charge and lead from their experience they gained from last year. So look for players like Josh Harper, who leads the Bulldogs with 62 receptions and six touchdowns, along with Josh Pizzotta, who, who gained 112 yards in the win over the Spartans, to step up on offense behind senior offensive guards Sean Rubelkava and Cody Whitman. Then, for a defense that's had its fair share of struggles, I'd like to see guys like Carl Mickelson, Deron Smith, Curtis Riley, and Tyler Davison go out with a bang. A lot will be on the coaching shoulder of, shoulders of my old teammate to vote, motivate his team for a very strong finish. On the other side of the field, Nevada is 6-4 and four overall. They're 3-3 three and three in conference play, coming off that heartbreaking loss in overtime to Air Force. But Don Jackson, I thought, was tremendous in that loss to Air Force. Rushed for three touchdowns. He was an absolute force on the field. How much will the Wolfpack need to lean on him over this next two-game stretch that will decide their postseason fate? Well, Nevada's offense still goes through quarterback Cody Vajardo. His performance, I thought, was amazing as well against Air Force in what can only be described as less than ideal conditions. So to slow down the Wolfpack, you've got to stop the multi-talented and dual threat ability of Fajardo. But that leaves the door open for a player just like Don Jackson. I think both Fresno State and UNLV will focus their defensive efforts on Fajardo first, and that could create opportunity for another performance or two like Jackson had against the Falcons. Brian Polian did exactly what you mentioned. He leaned on Jackson to the tune of 28 carries, and his most, that was his most for the season. And it was this willingness and patience that eventually led to some big plays that included a 32-yard scoring scamper in the third quarter. The past two seasons, we've seen Nevada turn to its rushing attack late in the year, and with the way Jackson has produced against both San Diego State and Air Force, I don't see that trend changing against the Bulldogs and then the Rebels. Much of how the Wolfpack's 2014 campaign finishes out will be determined on the legs of Don Jackson. By the time they kick this off in Reno, may know something that this could be for the West Division title. If Air Force beat San Diego State on Friday night, this game between Fresno State and Nevada will decide who represents the West Division in the Mountain West Championship game. Something to keep your eye on as Fresno State visits Nevada 7.30 Pacific time on ESPNU on Saturday night. The nightcap in the Mountain West once again will take place on the islands. UNLV visiting Hawaii, 6 o'clock Hawaii time. Oceanic Time Warner has your TV coverage on the islands. Mountain West Network will have the game on the mainland. Let's start with UNLV. The Rebels are 2-9 and nine overall, 1-5 and five in conference play. They lost to BYU. Thought they looked pretty good early in that game at Provo, 42-23, your final. But the Rebels do have Devontae Davis. They're all Mountain West caliber wide receiver. They've had him for the last two games against Air Force and BYU. How different do they look with their number one playmaker finally healthy and back in the lineup? Well, Davis has given Bobby Houck's offense some big play production and reliability that was resting squarely on the shoulders of freshman Devontae Boyd for most of the season. Davis has only played in six games, and he's the number two receiver with 28 receptions, 433 yards, and three touchdowns. This is a player that had 87 for 1290 and 14 touchdowns in 2013, and that's quite a bit of production taken away from that Rebel attack. 
Rebel fans can only wonder what a tandem of the Devontes might have done for this UNLV passing attack this season. But these guys, they're over six feet and play the big receiver game very, very well. At first glance, you don't really notice much of a difference in the box score. And certainly it didn't result in a win versus Air Force or BYU, having uh, both of them in the lineup. But the, UNL off the UNLV offense is a much more potent attack. It presents a number of problems for opposing defenses on third down in the red zone with Devontae Davis complimenting Devontae Boyd. Hawaii on the flip side came off a pretty big time performance against a passing team in San Jose State, shutting the Spartans out 13-0. They're now 3-8 and overall, 2-4 and in conference play. The Rainbow Warriors snapped a 17-game road losing streak with the win at San Jose State. As you, as you continue to find those small little building blocks in a season of we're getting better, this is one of those building blocks. How much can this do for Hawaii, getting over one of those major hurdles, a, a cloud that was looming over the program with that road losing yeah, streak? Yeah, first off, congratulations to Hawaii for getting that streak off their backs. We talk about how difficult it is for mainland teams to travel over to Honolulu in the middle of the season. Imagine being Norm Chow and getting your players ready for the same trip six times a year. Brutal is the best way that I can describe it. But what that game means is and can be much more than saying you've got three wins to your credit. For the program, it can create the confidence and present the understanding, the underclassmen of what it's going to take in the future to travel over and win on the road. Some great Hawaii teams have done it in the past, so it's not impossible, but you need to experience, you need to experience it first to repeat it a number of times over and over. And we've talked about it all season. The Warriors have been competitive at home and on the road. But they've had little to show for it for their efforts. And, it, and to get this win in a shutout is doubly sweet for a team that played some tough, aggressive defense most of the season. Hawaii's last big season was in 2010. They went 4-2 and two on the road. That, that followed a year where a late trip to San Jose State was capped by a 17-10 win. And that spun into that 10-4 and four record the following season. Perhaps this victory, perhaps, over the Spartans will have the same effect in the near future. I certainly think it can for Norm Chow's Warriors. Should be a fun one in the nightcap in the Mountain West. UNLV in Hawaii, 6 o'clock Hawaii time, Oceanic time. Warner has your TV coverage again, and the Mountain West Network will have the game on the mainlands. For Ted Sundquist, I'm Jesse Kurtz. Pay attention to those standings. You can always find the updated Mountain West standings as we get closer to that 2014 Mountain West Championship game on the MW.com.